hello everybody and um, welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here to celebrate our friend and our beloved colleague, John Goldberg, and his appointment as the Carter Professor of General Jurisprudence at Harvard Law School. So let's give him a big round of applause. Now, I'm, I'm going to start by saying a few words about the chair, which has a distinguished history that could not better fit its current occupant. So in 1905, James Coolidge Carter, who graduated from HLS in 1853, left a bequest that supports the Carter chair. He was one of the foremost lawyers of his time. When Carter died, the New York Times wrote glowingly that he possessed, quote, one of the most thoroughly equipped legal minds which this country has ever produced. And he was known for, quote, his acute and accurate judgment, powerful logic, and absolute force and clearness of statement. So as you can see, these words describe Professor Goldberg to a T. And there are two other things about James Coolidge Carter and the Carter Chair that also make it a perfect fit for our friend. One is that Carter was deeply devoted to ideals, to the spirit of philosophy, and to using philosophy to develop principles of truth and right. For those of you who know Professor Goldberg's work, perhaps his most striking contribution is his steadfast and persuasive commitment to the ideal that law has integrity as such, that behind doctrine lies a coherent set of principles that explain it, and that it is a worthy enterprise for lawyers and for those who learn and teach law to understand and apply those principles. Professor Goldberg, through his writing and his teaching, has conveyed that message powerfully and with much impact. I want to say one last thing connecting Professor Goldberg to his chair. So a chair has meaning not only because of who endowed it, but also because of who's held it. And Professor Goldberg rightly follows in a line of exceptionally eminent holders of this chair, including Lon Fuller, Charles Fried, Duncan Kennedy, and Martha Minow. It's fitting because like him, they are all great and rigorous thinkers. It's also fitting because they represent such a wide range of views and approaches. And Professor Goldberg has throughout his career advance the central value that we are better if we hear all sides and that disagreement and difference are exhilarating and give us an opportunity to learn. In short, Professor Goldberg is a superb and award-winning scholar, the leading tort theorist of our time. He's also a spectacular teacher, having taught across most of the first year curriculum <laughs> and having won multiple teaching prizes in the process. He is clear, funny, generous, and thought-provoking in the classroom as well as in the lunchroom. Now, before joining HLS, Professor Goldberg was on the Vanderbilt Law School faculty. He had clerked for Judge Weinstein on the Eastern District of New York and Justice White on the Supreme Court. He has a JD from NYU, an MPhil from Oxford, an MA from Princeton, and a BA from Wesleyan College. And now that I've talked about his biography, I just want to say personally a thank you to Professor Goldberg. You know, we've done a lot together. We've served countless years on every possible kind of committee the school has. <laughs> he was deputy dean for five years, longer than he anticipated serving, maybe even five years longer. <laughs> And no one could have asked for a better teammate, partner, and friend. Um, these were not easy years, uh, with several of them falling in the heart of the pandemic. And he stayed in the job precisely because they were not easy years. His wisdom, his strength, his good sense, his good heart, and his generosity made him not only invaluable, but also beloved by our entire team. 
So John Goldberg is not only a remarkable scholar and teacher, but also an extraordinary institutional contributor and an extraordinary person. I cannot thank you enough, my dear friend. So please join me in welcoming the Carter Professor of General Jurisprudence, John C. Pinkle. introduction like that is you have no hope of living up to it, so it's all downhill from here. Uh, uh, let me just start by saying thank you uh, to a lot of people. Uh, thank you uh, to Dean Manning, um, who uh, is all anyone could ask for in an academic leader. Um, this school is flourishing, and it's flourishing largely because of him, and uh, I couldn't be, there's nothing better than working at an institution where you believe in the leadership all the way through to the top, and so uh, we're incredibly lucky to have him in charge, and I'm incredibly honored to call him my friend. Um, thanks also to the staff of the law school, um, I see Liberty and Catherine back there, uh, who uh, actually make the school run, as you know, um, and uh, particularly Catherine for all her work on putting this uh, together. Uh, thanks to all of my colleagues who make every day at work a joy uh, and a treat. Uh, every day I run into somebody and we have an interesting conversation about something, um, and that's the joy of this job, uh, just that the ideas are there and people are willing to talk about them and have incredibly interesting things to say, so I can't quite believe this is what I actually do for a living. Um, speaking of what I do for a living, um, my students, uh, thank you all for putting up with me and my lame jokes. Um, thank you for um, challenging me um, and making me rethink uh, every time. I've now taught torts, I don't know, 15, 20 times, and every time I think I've got it down, I come into class and a student asks a question and I'm like, huh, oh well, got to start again. Uh, so uh, I'm deeply thrilled and, and that my, some of my students are here and I'm honored and I love uh, the job of teaching. Um, final sets of thank yous to my family, uh, my sons Alex and Matthew who couldn't be here today but who endured endless tort hypotheticals at the dinner table um, throughout their lives and have yet to sue me for it so I'm deeply grateful to them and for their love and support uh, and uh, to my wife Julie who is here today. Um, uh, nobody makes it through the world uh, without uh, people who love and support them, and I'm lucky to have an amazingly special person to love and support me. Uh, the most Im uh, many important facts about Julie, the one of the most important is that unlike certain people standing on the podium, she had the qualifications to be admitted to Harvard Law School. Uh, <laughs> in fact, graduated from Harvard Law School with distinction, um, so if you want to know who the smart one in the family is, talk to her. All right. Um, the last uh, people I want to thank are my uh, mom and dad. Uh, unfortunately, they're no longer with us, um, but there's a particular reason why uh, I want to mention them, which is uh, they were, uh, turns out, I didn't know this when I was growing up, I just thought they were normal mom and dad, um, but it turns out they had remarkable powers of prophecy, which they never let on. So my whole life, I've had these two middle initials. And everyone has said, Why do I have two middle initials? Right? Well, watch the screen and it'll all become clear. <laughs> they knew something. Uh, they figured it out in 1961. Uh, God bless them. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the Dean has already uh, introduced you to Mr. Carter, uh, there he is, um, so uh, I'll add a couple of other facts beyond the ones he already gave you. Uh, he's a graduate both of uh, Harvard University and Harvard Law School, he came actually from a family of quite modest means, they had to scrape uh, together money to get him through both of those schools, uh, he went on to become this incredibly famous uh, influential uh, a lawyer in his time. He argued more than 30 cases in front of the United States Supreme Court. He was often identified as someone who might be appointed uh, to the court. He, um, uh, his firm, it still exists, which is amazing. The year after he graduated from law school, I believe, I might be wrong, he founded it in like 1854 and it's now called 
Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. Uh, so you know, not many of us get that kind of uh, uh, staying power in the world. Did I just do something? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, a couple of other uh, fact, fun facts about uh, Carter. Um, he um, uh, annoyed uh, many of his clients and colleagues because he advocated before the adoption of the 16th Amendment for the progressive income tax. Um, and most of his uh, clients and colleagues thought well, that was an awful idea. Um, he thought it was an appropriate idea because he was very worried about, ready for it, the concentration of wealth in a few hands uh, in, through American capitalism. So uh, uh, whatever else he might have gotten wrong, he probably got that right. Um, last thing is a funny story, uh, for me anyway, um, maybe for the dean, I hope. Um, back uh, when Langdell was dean a million years ago, uh, someone got the great idea, hey, we should go to our well-to-do alums and ask them for money. Um, they hadn't been doing that before, at least not systematically. And so Langdell sent an emissary to New York to meet with the big shot lawyers in New York to try and raise some money. And it was a disaster. Um, uh, it didn't work. Um, uh, why didn't it work? Well, largely because Carter was there. And Carter told the dean's emissary, this is beneath the Harvard Law School, <laughs> for the dean's emissary to come hat in hand, begging for money. So, let's just say times have changed. <laughs> um, so, uh, as you heard, he did give this request for a chair in general jurisprudence. Um, and he was particularly, he wrote several books actually, uh, he was particularly interested in uh, the common law. Uh, he was very worried about <laughs> codification. Um, he thought that the field code, which had come out in New York, uh, and the idea that we were going to move to a more civilian type system was a terrible idea. He thought the common law was this repository of customs and norms and so on and so forth that needed to be understood and cherished. And so the gift actually says, uh, uh, this should be used for the cultivation and teachings of the distinction between the provinces of the written and the unwritten law. Now he's a very thoughtful guy. If you read the bequest, which you can find in the library along with everything else in the world, um, uh, uh, he actually says, that's what I'd like it for, but if you want to do something else with it, that's fine too. So <laughs> amiable felt. All right, we've also heard uh, about the history of the chair. Uh, so it actually goes all the way back to Joseph Beale, who was a, a very prominent scholar of conflicts of law, uh, now largely pilloried these days as a quote-unquote formalist, the F word. Um, <laughs> uh, he uh, uh, was the first holder of the chair, uh, then Roscoe Pound, then as you heard, Lon Fuller, uh, and then uh, uh, Freed, Kennedy, and Minow in succession. How, does this, how, would it make, how would this make you feel, right? Not good. Uh, so, uh, uh, we'll just, uh, I'll do my best is all I can promise. Um, all right, so general jurisprudence. It's a chair in general jurisprudence. What's general jurisprudence? Um, obviously, jurisprudence evokes notions of philosophy and the idea of uh, taking philosophical method and using it to illuminate uh, uh, legal uh, uh, ideas. Um, now, uh, undoubtedly, there are some people who are skeptical about the value of philosophizing about law, and maybe even some people in this room. You don't have to raise your hands right now. Um, here's uh, Prosser quoting a famous proverb about the value of philosophy. A philosopher is a blind person in a dark cellar at midnight looking for a black cat that isn't there. Um, this is not a very attractive picture uh, of the philosophical enterprise, uh, to say the least. Um, and I think it's attributable originally to Mencken, but I'm not sure. But it's an old, old, there are variations on this adage going way back. Um, uh, uh, if it makes you feel any better, Prosser was a deeply cynical person, and so he was equally mean to lawyers. Um, uh, and he therefore says, uh, Philosopher is distinguished from a lawyer who smuggles in a cat in his overcoat pocket and emerges to produce it in his mind. Uh, so, uh, uh, you shouldn't feel too bad for the philosophers. Um, more seriously, um, what can philosophy do for law? Well, lots of things. Um, there's the analytic side, uh, which Fuller represents, uh, where we ask questions like, what is law? 
what makes a norm a legal norm as opposed to some other kind of norm, what is the relation of law to morality, which Fuller was probably most famous for exploring. Um, these are deep questions that are unavoidable at some level. We can put them off for a time, but sooner or later we always come back to them and need to uh, engage them. These are all, if you will, on the analytic side of general jurisprudence. There's also a prescriptive side to general jurisprudence uh, where we ask questions like, you know, well, why do we have contract law anyway? What do we do with that? Well, it turns out our friend Professor Freed has a few thoughts on that uh, and argued that, for example, uh, contract law is a means by which uh, the morality of promising is bolstered and reinforced and uh, elaborated. Well, that's a theory of law. It's a philosophical theory of law. Um, we also have uh, in this building and elsewhere many people who took, for example, the political philosophy of John Rawls and used it as a way of developing constitutional law. Frank Michaelman, for example, suggesting that the U.S. Constitution ought to, in a sense, be reconstructed uh, in, uh, 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 in, uh, in accordance with the ideals of Rawlsian political theory. And then, of course, you have a tradition of critical philosophy, uh, whether it's utilitarian in the spirit of Bentham or critical legal studies or critical race theory. All of these uh, uh, rightly raise the question of, do we want anything like uh, the current system of law that we have? So uh, uh, as the photos, ho I hope, suggest, the previous holders of this uh, chair have all weighed in in different important, exciting ways on questions of general jurisprudence. I'm going to suggest uh, that uh, there's another thing among many that philosophy can do for law, um, and that is uh, sort of leave law alone, so to speak, to <laughs> let law uh, be law. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is, um, as you know, if you're law students and uh, law professors, the dominant mode uh, of legal scholarship since, I don't know, pick a date, 1975, 1980, is law and dot, dot, dot. Law and economics, law and philosophy, law and history, law and sociology, whatever. In each of those, the tendency, not always, but the tendency is to, for the and part to do the work, right? So it's law and economics with the thought, we really need economics if we're going to make any sense of law or we really need philosophy if we're going to make any sense of law. That's fine, and there's real insights done through that way of thinking. Um, I'm going to suggest that actually uh, a philosophical approach to law is one that allows, so to speak, law to speak for itself, uh, to try, uh, uh, which means engaging law on its own terms, trying to understand the logic that is there in it, or at least in parts of it, um, uh, so you might call this, so to speak, reconstruction rather than deconstruction, trying to understand what we're dealing with. Now, to be clear, I'm not sure uh, when you do this sort of thing you end up with anything. It's quite possible that in your effort to understand the law on its own terms, you conclude the law is a mess. Um, that is certainly possible, and of course it's always possible and often common, sadly, that you will conclude the law may not be a mess, but it's terrible. That's a different question. Uh, uh, but for the first step, I want to try uh, uh, in my own work, uh, and I think other people do as well, uh, to try and understand law on its own terms. And what that means in the common law context, which is of course what Carter was really interested in, is can we make sense of the common law's concepts categories and characteristic patterns of legal reasoning. When we read all these cases applying common law principles, is there something coherent, more or less, going on there? And what is it? Okay? And this finally gets us to the talk of nuisance. Typical law professor kicks seven slides to clear one's throat. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about nuisance for uh, the rest of the way here. Um, and a, a trigger warning, uh, nuisance is yucky, as its name suggests. Um, of course, as my students know, torts is yucky. Um, torts is a, it's a weird subject to spend your life thinking about. It's about bad things being done to other people, and it's kind of gruesome sometimes. So uh, these won't be particularly gruesome, but just so you know, we're entering the world of torts. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with what's called private nuisance. Um, and one way to understand what private nuisance is is with some simple examples. Okay? So 
uh, the neighborhood sewage treatment plant generates nauseating smells, I told you this was going to be yucky, uh, that are so bad that the nearby residents can't go out in their backyards and have a picnic or you know, whatever. Okay? Uh, that's a classic private nuisance. Okay? Another example, famous based on an English case, I changed the facts slightly, but it's the same idea. There's a bakery that shares a common wall with a doctor, this is the case of Sturgis versus Bridgman, and the doctor does some consulting uh, out of his house in one of his rooms, and because there's equipment on that shared wall that rattles and makes a lot of noise, the doctor can't use his consulting room, it's too loud, it's, there's too much vibration, uh, uh, and the court says that's a private nuisance. The uh, bakery, or confectioner as it was in this case, has committed the tort of private nuisance as against uh, uh, the doctor. Um, then there's a famous case about uh, uh, public sex. Uh, so somebody has a beach, and there are a bunch of people who've decided that this is the right place to express their love for one another in a physical manner. Um, and unfortunately, there is a family uh, that owns a home right at the locus of the beach, uh, and they get to see this, and they can't unsee it, if you will. Uh, uh, it's pervasive, it's regular, and uh, the only way to avoid it uh, is to not look out their windows. Um, that was deemed to be a nuisance as well. Last example, and I'll come back to these as we go on. I'm going to give it a different font, I think, if I'm... Oh, sorry, you're going to wonder what the picture was. There's the picture. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so, uh, uh, last example uh, is uh, 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 one I've... This is a hypothetical. It's not based on a real case, so it's weird. Um, you've got a cabin owner with a cabin in the woods using ordinary wood in an ordinary fireplace. Lo and behold, because it's a law professor hypothetical, super weird thing happens, which is there's some weird spores or mold uh, in the wood, undetectable, exceedingly rare. Nobody would expect them to be there. Um, and when the uh, cabin owner uses the wood in the fireplace, the smoke goes out and kills the neighbor's trees. Um, now, I've consulted some of my colleagues who actually know more about nuisance than I do, including Professor Brady and Professor Smith, among others. Um, I'm going to poll all of my uh, property colleagues uh, before I'm done on this, and they assure me this is a nuisance. Um, so, uh, I'm going to take that as more authoritative than any court decision um, uh, and uh, uh, treat it as a nuisance accordingly. All right. So, those are all examples, uh, just to bring you into the weird world of private nuisance. Um, if you like, instead of examples, you like definitions, I've got those two. Um, and where do you look for when you're looking for a definition? You go to chat GPT. Uh, so I asked chat GPT, what is a nuisance? And uh, chat GPT says uh, this, a private nuisance is a type of civil wrong that occurs when a person's use or enjoyment of their own property is unreasonably interfered with by the actions of another. Examples include loud noises, unpleasant odors, pollution, and unsightly views. Not bad. Uh, um, a little worrying. Uh, not bad. Um, as we will see, however, not good enough. Um, so, uh, um, all right. So, um, Turns out ChatGPT is on the right track, um, but um, is a little too uh, pat, a little too cut and dry. Um, uh, why is that? Well, um, uh, so uh, there's a the ChatGPT tells us that uh, private nuisance is a civil wrong, which is another phrase for tort. That's what Blackstone called torts, civil wrongs or private wrongs. Um, all right, well, what's a tort anyway? Now we're going to have to get a little philosophical here. If, in order to figure out whether uh, uh, a private nuisance is a tort, we need to know what a tort is. Well, my students will recognize the pretzel uh, on the screen. Um, all torts are pretzels. Um, uh, why is that? Well, pretzels are twisted, and the Latin derivation of tort is torquer. Sorry, Liz, I'm sure I mispronounced that. Um, uh, and that, uh, that means twisted. Uh, and it's not an accident that that's the etymology. It's twisted in multiple senses. It's twisted in the sense of lacking rectitude, unwrongful conduct. It's twisted in the sense of somebody gets twisted, somebody gets hurt. And it's twisted in the sense that the point is to uh, rectify and put things straight. Right? So it turns out the etymology of the word tort is enormously illuminating, as, as true for many legal concepts. So we're looking for one of these pretzels. We're looking for 
uh, whether uh, private nuisance is one of these injurious wrongs, which is what a tort is, injurious civil wrong. So I've put private nuisance for the moment in the torts circle or oval or bucket. Um, uh, of course, there's lots of other torts. There's some of them. That's not all of them. Uh, students will recognize those. Uh, some of them are placed strategically. I'm not sure abnormally dangerous activities is really a tort, and that's why it's on the end. Uh, but uh, uh, in any event, um, uh, these are all examples of these twistings. Uh, and the question is, does private nuisance really belong here, or does it not? Right? And this is not just a semantic question. This is a philosophical, theoretical, uh, and doctrinal question. Uh, because it turns out there's actually pretty good reason, notwithstanding uh, Jack GPT, there's pretty good reason to think actually private nuisance doesn't belong uh, in the Oval. Why is that? Well, um, uh, where's the wrong? If you look at a, a truncated definition of private nuisance, it doesn't look like a lot of other wrongs. It doesn't identify a way of behaving that is wrongful exactly. It doesn't say something like A intentionally interferes with B's use of land. And it doesn't even say A negligently interferes with B's use of land. In fact, there's no adverb at all in the tort. So there's no description of substandard conduct, which you typically see, which is why torts are typically wrong. All there is is it's just got to interfere enough. So as long as you interfere enough with somebody else's use and enjoyment of their property, you're subject to liability for the tort of nuisance. And that's one of the puzzles of the Baker case, right? It turns out in the actual case, Sturgis, it's an old English case, the baker, I'm the person I'm calling the baker, um, was not a miscreant by any means. The baker actually was uh, not uh, pleased to be interfering with the doctor. Uh, the baker went to great lengths to try to arrange things so as not to bother the doctor. Uh, uh, and, but the problem was the baker just couldn't operate the machines that the baker needed to operate in order uh, to run the bakery without uh, bothering uh, the doctor. And the court says, nuisance, um, uh, just by virtue of uh, the level of interference, the constant noise and the constant vibrations. Well, that doesn't look like a wrong. It's bad, it's unfortunate, it's a harm, but it doesn't, at least on its face, look like a wrong. And if it's not a wrong, what's it doing in the tort's oval? Um, and of course, uh, a nuisance law is to blame for Ronald Coase. Um, the reason we have uh, Ronald Coase and the Coase theorem is because he read a bunch of nuisance cases. Okay, he was brilliant too, um, but he read a bunch of nuisance cases and he said, I don't, I don't get this. In cases like Sturgis, the court seems to be saying, Baker, you have to pay the doctor because you've done something wrong. Or Baker, you're going to be enjoined from using your machines because you've done something wrong. It's your responsibility. And Coase says, I don't see any wrong here. I just see a very unfortunate circumstance. We have two activities that are interfering with each other. Why prioritize baking or doctoring over baking? They're just two activities operating in a space such that they happen to be incompatible. And so the point, one of Coase's points is just, look, there's no, there's no value here in a case like this, at least, of um, uh, uh, trying to determine who should be allowed to do what they're doing on the basis of some notion of wrongdoing or responsibility. There's no factual purchase for that. Um, so we've got to come up with some other way of deciding whether to have the doctor be the doctor or the baker be the baker, what's the other way of deciding? Well, of course, uh, as you all know, uh, right, from uh, the Coast theorem, etc., is what you want judges to do is to stop asking the backward-looking responsibility question, who's to blame, who did this, who's at fault, and ask the forward-looking question of what, uh, uh, who, do we, who do we, as a court, who do we order to stop? Or do we order anyone to stop in order to get the property to its highest value use? So it's a sort of welfareist conception of what we can do with the tort of nuisance now, uh, sorry, with tort law in nuisance cases. But if that's what we're doing 
with, tort law, uh, with nuisance cases, we're not in the torts <coughs> building anymore, as far as I'm concerned. Now, that's no reason to cry, right? Maybe we don't want to be in the torts building, but uh, I just want to be clear that if Coase is right about private nuisance, then we're not looking um, at uh, a tort anymore. We're looking at something else. We're looking at an occasion for judges to make uh, regulatory decisions, which is fine, but that's a different kind of thing. It's subject to different rules, different procedures, different values, etc. Now, uh, turns out Coase uh, 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 who was very careful and thoughtful, um, uh, was speaking in Chicago, and there was uh, uh, a young scholar in the room named Richard Posner. Um, and Posner, unlike uh, Coase, uh, had no restraint whatsoever. Um, and so uh, Posner says, Eureka, the Coase theorem not only explains nuisance law, which has all these weird features, including the feature of not obviously having any wrongdoing, and Posner says, you can say the same thing about everything. <laughs> Negligence, battery, whatever. No wrongdoing there either. It's all just what Coase said. It's all just people interfering with other people. Right? And then you go down the Posnerian route full bore, and what do you end up? You end up with the nightmare. Right? <laughs> uh, you end up uh, with tort law being completely reconceived as public law, and that's when I quit. Uh, I'm not interested in that, and I'm not good at public law. So, all right. So this is why Chat GPT is a little too uh, uh, a little too simplistic, right? And there's a lesson in this, students: don't rely too much on Chat GPT. Uh, uh, there's more to learn here. Um, all right. So back to jurisprudence and philosophy. If we're going to go forward and try and uh, identify what could possibly make private nuisance a tort after all, which of course is the historical position of the courts and the common law, um, what do we need to do? Well, we need to do a bunch of things. Um, we need to have an understanding that private law really is different from regulatory law, okay? Um, and then we need an account of what private law is. That's a jurisprudential question, and lots of people uh, have weighed in on that, including me. Here I want to make uh, an overdue shout out um, to my frequent co-author, uh, Professor Ben Zapersky at uh, Fordham uh, Law School. Uh, he and I have been writing together uh, since we were, sadly, law students, believe it or not. Um, uh, I meant some of you know this story. Uh, ben and I met on the first day of law school. Uh, we were in the same small section and reading group together, and we started talking about torts on a fateful fall day uh, in uh, 19, uh, let's see, 88, uh, and have not stopped. Um, so be careful who you talk to, students. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Ben, uh, both individually and Ben and I together, uh, have been spending a lot of time not only on tort law, but on uh, trying to understand private law. Uh, another person who gets, uh, deserves a shout out here is um, uh, my wonderful colleague, Henry Smith. Uh, Professor Smith and I um, have been spending a lot of time along with Professor Brady on this project on uh, the uh, foundations of private law and a lot of what that project is about is trying to sort of make sense of private law as a distinctive kind of law. Um, and again, this is not to say private law is better than public law or anything like that, it's just to say it's different and it has different ideas and different organizing uh, principles. So in torts at least, um, not all of private law, but in torts, uh, it's all about defining interpersonal wrongs, what we owe each other, how we mistreat each other, um, and when, uh, uh, what sort of mistreatments will give rise to a power in the victim to obtain recourse from the wrongdoer. I've got a whole book on that uh, for anyone who wants to read uh, uh, the subject. Um, I happen, you know, to think that tort law makes the world a better place overall, but uh, that's not the reason we have it. Um, uh, we have it because uh, individuals who have been wronged are entitled uh, uh, to obtain forms of redress from those who have wronged them. All right. Uh, what else do we need? We need an account of common law. And here I invoke Carter directly. Um, I think he was right. I think he was on to something. There is something distinctive and important about the common law that needs to be understood and that it's a different kind of law. 
It isn't, if you will, Coasean social engineering, and Professor Smith pops up on the screen because he's written about this. Um, uh, you know, Coase's whole idea that, hey, you know, the, uh, the, the doctor is interfering with the baker just as much as the baker is interfering with the doctor, right? Uh, that reciprocal causation idea, um, it only works in a world, never mind transaction costs, which Coase is famous for, it only works in a world without norms. Um, and the common law is all about translating social and moral norms into legal rules. Turns out that we have lots of norms, and some of them might be good, some of them might be bad, but here's a norm we generally observe, although maybe it's changing with you kids today. Um, you know, uh, probably you shouldn't be having sex in public. Uh, uh, you know, except under special conditions, you know, nudist camp or whatever. I don't know what goes on at this place. But, uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, when you say, hey, the folks who are using the beach to have sex, well, that's just them using the beach that way. And the family that lives in the home that just doesn't want to see people having sex, that's just, they're just doing what they're doing, and it's just a conflict. Um, and we just have to pick who gets to, who, who gets to do what they want to do. That's not how we do things uh, in the common law, for better or worse. We have norms about what, uh, uh, that give us starting points and that make us, uh, help us understand what's an interference with what. Um, finally, I think we need an account of legal wrongs, and this is what I want to focus on for the rest of uh, my time, and I'm almost done, you'll be pleased to know. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, um, <clears throat> I have an understanding of what a legal wrong is, and it's uh, kind of boring. Uh, a legal wrong is what it sounds like. It is a violation of a conduct guiding legal rule or directive. So you can't have a legal wrong until you've got a legal rule uh, now, we're going to have to spend a lot of time figuring out what counts as a legal rule, but I'm not going to do that here. But if you've got a legal rule which says you must behave yourself in the following way or you may not behave yourself in the following way, and you break that rule, now we're looking at a legal wrong. Okay? And here's the interesting thing about legal wrongs. They can be strict. Now, a lot of people learn in law school, wrongly, that uh, strict liability means no wrongdoing. I don't agree with that. Um, I think there are lots of legal wrongs. Moral is a different question we can talk about, but I think there are lots of legal wrongs that are strict liability wrongs, and there's nothing oxymoronic or incoherent to say such a thing. That is to say, um, uh, the rule, just by virtue of the rule being particularly strict, you may well break it even if you've done behaved reasonably. So the familiar example from trespass law, which all of my students are sick to death of, is you build a fence, you have every reason to believe you're building it on your property, and it's wrong, right? And it turns out you build it on your neighbor's property. Well, that's a trespass. And you say, but, but, I didn't mean it. Tough, right? But I was super careful. Tough, right? Um, it's a wrong. It's wrong to build a fence on someone else's property. Why? Because there's a legal rule which says don't build things on other people's prop other people's property. So, um, uh, so once we have these kinds of tools, which I think philosophy helps us to grasp, um, we can go back and uh, find out that ChatGPT was right uh, after all. Um, so back to the world of common law torts. I want to say private nuisance, sort of like abnormally dangerous activities, but even more so, is mostly a tort. 99 times out of 100, a tort. What do I mean by that? Well, what's the wrong? I think the wrong has something to do with a norm of neighborliness. I think it is unneighborly to constantly make noise with your bakery to drive your neighbor doctor crazy, right? And it doesn't mean you're careless. We're not talking about negligence. It doesn't mean you intended to drive the doctor crazy or anything like that. It's just not a way in which neighbors should interact with their neighbors. It's taking too much liberty for yourself and not being sufficiently attentive to the interests uh, or respectful of the interests of your neighbor. So I think the uh, treatment, sewage treatment plant case, uh, the bakery equipment case, and the sex on the beach case, yes, I know that's the name of the drink. Uh, <laughs> They are all um, uh, cases of unneighborliness, and I think they're all wrongs as such. Okay? So, uh, sure, plenty of unneighborly conduct is intentional or negligent or whatever, but the category of unneighborly is bigger than that, and sometimes it can generate one of these 
strict liability wrong. Now, the fireplace example gives me heartburn. Sorry, bad pun. Uh, uh, gives me heartburn. Uh, 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 I'm not sure about the fireplace one. I'm not sure that our imagined cabin owner has done anything that can cogently be described as unneighborly. All they did was burn wood in the usual way, and we're assuming they're allowed to do it, and it just turns out there were these weird spores that they couldn't have detected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think there's a difference between the fireplace case and the bakery case, and I think it's a salient difference. And if we're going to impose liability in the fireplace case, I think we've left the torts building. I think this is the point at which private nuisance in this particular application ceases to be tort liability and becomes something else. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this is a hard question and I'm still thinking about it. All right. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, uh, there's all kinds of fun questions to ask uh, if you go down this weird route that I've gone down. Uh, you know, really, you know, tell us more. What is this unneighborliness thing you're talking about? Um, can you really spell it out as a norm? Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, me too, if you have any suggestions. <laughs> um, what counts as an interference, right? I haven't really, I've just put that question to the side, but not everything can count as an interference in the usage of nuisance law. So, for example, um, if I uh, 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 make it, if, if I uh, uh, outcompete you with my business, and send you to the quote-unquote poorhouse, and you lose your residence, I guess I've interfered with your use and enjoyment of your property. You don't have it anymore. <laughs> so you can't use it and enjoy it, right? Nobody thinks that's a nuisance. Uh, why not? Well, one answer is not the right kind of interference. Fine. Well, what is the right kind? of interference, right? Um, and here we must correct uh, our friends over at chat GPD, chat, uh, chat GPT. Um, oops, that didn't work. Uh, that black line is supposed to be over unsightly views. Uh, uh, just wrong, right? Molly, just wrong, right? Chat GPT screwed up. An unsight subjecting, you know, go ahead and park your rusty old cars in your front lawn, even if they're in view of your neighbor, um, that's not a nuisance. Subjecting someone to an unpleasant, aesthetically unpleasant experience is not a nuisance, unless you do it out of mass, right? unless you're doing it just to mess with your neighbor. Um, so why is that? Or, speaking of Professor Brady, um, right? what about projecting light onto the side of somebody's house or a message that they don't want to give? Professor Brady has argued persuasively that is the right kind of interference, at least under some circumstances. Or, if you don't like those, I've got one more. Um, famous case, or quickly becoming famous case out of England. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well from there. These are apartments with uh, floor-to-ceiling glass windows uh, being looked into. They are being looked into from the viewing gallery of the Tate, the rooftop gallery of the Tate Modern. In, which is a museum in downtown London. Uh, and turns out that the folks who live in these apartments didn't appreciate the fact that the Tate Modern's rooftop gallery attracted thousands and thousands of people who spent a fair bit of time looking into their apartments um, and taking videos, etc., etc. And uh, the residents sued the Tate Modern and said, nuisance, you're interfering with our use and enjoyment of our apartment, which is not a crazy thing to do. Indeed, they won. The, uh, the UK Supreme Court, I think, in a three to two decision, said this is a nuisance. Being viewed, as opposed to, as opposed to viewing, being viewed, uh, at least under certain circumstances, uh, can count as a nuisance. So there's a lot to think about under the heading of what do we mean in the context of nuisance about interference. Okay? Um, lastly, remember I said, but maybe I'm wrong, uh, the, the, the fireplace example. Uh, I said that was outside, we left the building, we're not in nuisance or tort law anymore. Well, if that's true, I'm not sure it is, but if that's true, who says courts get to impose liability when we're not looking at a tort or a breach of contract? Is this an equitable wrong? Under what circumstances can courts go outside of? relatively well-defined bodies of common law and say, yeah, this isn't one of those, 
but you still have to pay, right? It's still a nuisance, even though it's not a tort of private nuisance. So these are all questions I'm working on. Um, last uh, uh, slide, yay. Um, my dean, one of my dean's favorite phrases is, this is the $64,000 question. Now, that used to be a lot of money. Um, uh, back when the dean and I were growing up, uh, you said $64,000, and people were like, whoa. Uh, right, now that's, what, a half a semester's tuition, right? Uh, 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 this, uh, this is meant to signify, for those of you who don't know better, this is a big deal. Um, okay, uh, what's the $64,000 question? Um, uh, is there a coherent and useful general common law concept of nuisance? What do I mean by general? Well, let me explain. We've been talking to now, up to now, about this thing called private nuisance. That's been our entire focus of my presentation, this tort, uh, wrongfully interfering with use and enjoyment of another's property. There's another nuisance out there. Um, and it's this thing called public nuisance. Um, and public nuisance uh, is actually not, in the first instance at least, is not a tort. It's a crime. It's a low-level crime. Um, but it turns out, back in the 1600 and something, uh, some English judges said, if a private nuisance, the crime of private nuisance is committed, as a result of which some particular person suffers some particular injury, they can sue civilly for damages on the back of this crime. Okay? Uh, what, what is this crime, by the way? Well, it's things like uh, blocked roads. So if you build a structure that blocks a public road, that's a public nuisance. Why? Because no member of the public can exercise their right that they enjoy. Uh, to use the public road. You're not interfering with any individual's private right of property possession or whatever. You're interfering with rights common to the public. Same if you foul up public water so nobody in the community can swim or fish or whatever in the water. And everyone's favorite brothels uh, are a public nuisance. And we can talk about why they may or may not be. Um, these are all public nuisances, and the idea behind this civil actionability is, goes something like this. Look, imagine somebody is responsible for blocking a public road, and because of the blockage, there's a car accident, and somebody's injured in the car accident. The victim of the accident doesn't have to sue in negligence, the way most car accident victims do, uh, does under our system. The victim can sue and say, the blockage was a public nuisance. I got injured because of the public nuisance liability. Okay, so the crime of public nuisance, when where applicable, generates potentially civil liability. All right. Well, why is this the sixty-four thousand dollar question? I hope you're asking, because I certainly haven't made the case yet. Um, uh, uh, it's because uh, today's biggest litigation is all about public nuisance. So, uh, never mind sixty-four thousand dollars, billions and billions of dollars. <coughs> are at stake here on the question of whether things like selling handguns so as to make, for example, downtown Chicago unlivable because of the uh, 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 amount of violence, at least in certain neighborhoods, right? Or uh, uh, selling addictive prescription opioid drugs so as to destroy uh, or contribute to the destruction of entire community or uh, uh, spewing out lots of carbon into the world and helping to bring about very disastrous climate change, right? Plaintiff's lawyers around the country are bringing lawsuits representing people, often interestingly government entities, cities and states, saying these cities and states have claims for public nuisance. The, uh, 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 the opioid epidemic has generated something that counts as a public nuisance, and these cities and towns are left holding the bag economically, paying for all the fallout of the opioid ep epidemic. That's just like the car victim who's hurt by the blockage in the road. And so the cities and towns should be able to recover from the opioid manufacturers uh, because the opioid manufacturers created a public nuisance that has caused special harm to the cities and towns. So that's why this is a huge deal. Now, uh, where does jurisprudence and private law come into all this? Well, plaintiff's lawyers might say nowhere. Uh, but uh, uh, here's my foil, of course. Where do you go? You go to Salmon on Torts. <laughs> 
from 1936. Um, Salmond on torts tells us these two kinds of nuisance, and by the way, he's not idiosyncratic. This is a very common view. This is just an accident that these two things have the same name. Nuisance is just a French word that means annoying or annoyance. Uh, and sometimes some judges used it to talk about one thing, which we now call private nuisance, and some judges used to talk uh, about another thing, which we call public nuisance, and it's a purely superficial similarity. They have nothing to do with each other, theoretically or conceptually. All right? I think my suspicion, only a suspicion, is that that's wrong. My suspicion is that the two things actually do have something to do with each other, and that if we can understand, they're not the same thing, don't get me wrong, but they're two members of the same family, and it's only a suspicion at this point, I got a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, my suspicion is we're gonna find out, if we do our law right, that public nuisance and private nuisance have a lot to do with each other. Uh, and I'm not sure, just to be clear, I'm not sure what the implications are. Um, for who's going to win or who's going to lose if anyone believes me. Um, uh, I, I'll take it wherever it goes, seriously. I want to see if these concepts hang together. I think they do. I think I've read enough cases now to have a hypothesis that actually public nuisance and private nuisance really do have something to do with each other and that that's going to inform court and should inform court's judgments about when there should be liability for it. All right. That's all I have to say other than give you a wrap-up because I'm, as a good professor, you're supposed to remind people what they learned. Um, so, uh, uh, what have you learned? Uh, you've learned that Carter was nice, uh, a Carter. Uh, you've learned that there's lots of ways to be philosophical about law and be productively philosophical about law. Uh, private uh, nuisance is indeed a pretzel most of the time. Um, and lastly and most importantly, you have learned that even an annoying lecture does not constitute a private nuisance uh, and therefore is no basis for tort liability against the speaker. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, because that's uh, part of that rests on the larger claim, which I haven't defended here, uh, that torts are wrongs. Um, they're a special kind of wrong. They're wrongfully inflicted injury. Uh, so if there's a wrong with no injury, it's not a tort. And if there's an injury with no wrong, there's not a tort. But that falls out of a larger claim. Um, sorry, did you want to follow well, up? What, I yeah. think that, that is, I'm worried that you're smuggling it back into unneighborly. Yeah. That, that is just another word of yeah. saying it's too much of an injury. Yes, absolutely. That is, I, 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 uh, I am up at night worrying about <laughs> exactly that problem. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I was only half joking in my response on the sex on the beach case. I don't think it's an aesthetic nuisance. And the, the aesthetic nuisance cases are, um, you know, the rusty cars in the neighbor's yard kind of thing, right? That's not the complaint of the homeowners in the beach case. The complaint of the homeowners is not that I'm looking at something hideous or ugly. The claim is um, this is a kind of thing that when I walk out in the door in the morning, I'm entitled not to be confronted by. Um, uh, it's, it, it's something that belongs in private rather than in public. Uh, uh, Brilliant lecture. Uh, the question is the relationship, your intuition about the relationship between public and private nuisance and your willingness and strong defense that there's such a thing as private law that is different from public law. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. what your intuition is, whether those two why would they Why would they go together? Yes, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so good. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that I don't think there's a, I don't think it's accurate to say that there is presumptively uh, uh, overlap between private and public law such that if you see the word nuisance in public law and you see it in private law, you know they're going to be the same and quite the opposite. Maybe uh, uh, maybe it's the, we should presume that they're not the same for the reasons you suggest. Um, I guess I would say a couple things. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, um, even though public nuisance is a public wrong in the first instance, a crime, um, a lot of the case law is about the tort side of public nuisance, these cases where individuals say, I was harmed by the public nuisance. And so we end up talking about the crime in a tort context very often. So that's one reason why I'm uh, thinking there's going to be some overlap. Another more basic reason is I think uh, before we had private and public nuisance, we just had nuisance. Um, and I need to talk to uh, Professor Kamali a bit more about this, but uh, uh, I'm pretty sure if you go way back to Bracton and people like that, you're just going to see the word nuisance, um, and it's only uh, uh, later that you get the division, and that gives me some confidence that in this particular case there's overlap, even though in other cases there won't be. Kristen? Um, thank you very much, as always. So interesting and also humorous. Um, you asked, is there a coherent and useful general common law concept of nuisance? And it seems that part of the problem is how much is in nuisance, yeah. the capaciousness of it. And so uh, the question is then, why is nuisance the place to put things when one wants to do some kind of balancing move away from the strict yeah. rule, but maybe not know where to put it? So, we share a section, as yeah. you know, and um, today we covered solar panels, yeah. right, and the yeah. blocking access to light. Tomorrow we're going to talk about surface water, and all of these items, when a court wants to move away from a strict rule, says, treat them like nuisance, right. do the nuisance balancing. <laughs> so it's part of nuisance, the problem of nuisance is, is that it is so attractive ah. as a document. Good <laughs> towards both. <laughs> 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 um, is that it's such an attractive place? To put questions when you might want to move away from yeah. a strict rule, leading to the part of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. So, great question. Thank you. And I'm glad you're teaching my students they'll actually learn something about nuisance. Um, <laughs> so, um, Thank you for that. The, um, uh, so, you know, Prosser famously back in the, I don't know, in the 60s said, nuisance is a quote unquote garbage can. Right, it's, uh, it's where everything goes when you can't find any other place for it and you don't really want it anymore, right? But it's just this miscellaneous category. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't think it's that miscellaneous. Um, so it's true um, that as compared to trespass to land, where we really don't do much balancing, as my law students know from me hectoring them about this, right? We don't care why you trespassed. 
if you trespass, you're liable. I don't care if you have the best reason in the world to trespass, it's still a trespass. In nuisance, we do build in some notion of reasonableness, and that makes it different from trespass. But I don't think that's because it's a residual kind of leftover garbage can category. I think it's because it's a different wrong. Um, uh, it isn't about uh, entry and uh, presence, uh, physical presence, the way uh, trespass is. It really is about interference with use use and enjoyment, and then we have to figure out which interferences with use and enjoyment are wrongful, and we're not willing to say, I think for good reasons, that every interference with use and enjoyment is an injury in the relevant sense, and so now we have to do something more elaborate than we do in trespass. So I'm going to resist the claim that everything ends up being a nuisance. I'm just going to say nuisance is a different wrong. All right, let's thank Professor Goldberg.